Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our next episode of Six Feet Under Exhumed. I am Carrie the Mortician. I'm Faith, that mortuary professor. This is Six Feet Under Season 2, Episode 11. The title of the episode is The Liar and the Whore. And we are in a nursing home. Yes. There are, or yeah, it's a nursing home. There are two women sharing a room, which, does that, is that still a thing? It is. Oh, man. Yeah. That's got to be no fun. Um, one is complaining, the other one's ignoring her. So you're not really sure, you know, what's happening, um, yeah. if one's dead or one or whatever, but it, it, it ends up being that one is just complaining and the other one's ignoring her. And then one of the nurses goes into the room a little bit later and she has stopped breathing and she's dead. So she's dead. And we see the one is Rico's wife that's right. come in. So there's first kind of nurse or caretaker comes in and then the other one that she's like, oh my gosh, come in here. And she comes in and it's like, oh no, what's her name? What's his wife's name? Vanessa. Vanessa. Thank you. And so they're like, is this a code? What do we do? And so yeah. they don't, you don't really see that they start CPR or anything because she has been dead for a while. And then they pan yeah. back over to the other lady and she's just still do, 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 do. So you really don't know if something happened. Or- yeah. It kind of gives you the the idea that maybe something happened or yeah. maybe she's glad she's dead or something. But then it's also like, these are two pretty infirm little old ladies. What, like, what I would think if they got into a kerfluffle there would somebody would hear something but who knows so and her name is edith the little yeah. the deceased yep we dive in um dave is trying to help the niece get ready so we kind of jump forward that taylor is staying with mm-hmm. keith and dave and they don't really there's no explanation beyond she's just there I, yeah, because that's the most logical. And Dave's kind of jumping into this caretaker you know. role. And it's like, it's hilarious because I'm like, oh my gosh, this is me every morning. Because yeah. she's like, well, that doesn't go together. And why would you even do that? And why are you living in here? I didn't a- ask for your help. I don't have anything to wear. I need stuff to wear. That's not good enough. And then she's like, well, she's nine. And I was like, bingo. Oh, I'm beyond that. I'm just like the car. I am leaving in this car in eight minutes. If you're not in it, have a good day here by yourself. And I'm like, I'll take you to school in your underwear. If that's yeah, I don't care anymore. I I don't take any crap. And I I felt, I felt very insane at that moment. All the mornings are tough, but I don't know when they when they stop being tough. I don't know ever, ever. My mornings are still tough, I think, for me, and I'm 46. So, you know, what do you do? Oh, I do. I get it. But, you um, know. And we find, like, this scene I loved because we get this glimpse of him being a dad. And him, like, falling into this role, which I never would have expected that for him or him wanting that. But he j- jumps into it so yeah easily. And I kind of, so we kind of get this glimpse um, then we jump back to the funeral home and Nate's working and this guy comes in and he says, I'm here to see Nathaniel Fisher. And he's like, well, that's my dad. He's dead. And he goes, oh, wait, I'm Nathaniel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and so he gets served papers. It's a yeah. lawsuit from mm-hmm. the lady whose husband had died, um, falling off the drunk guy, fell off the boat, got ran over by the propeller. She insisted on seeing him. Nate opened the um, the casket and should not have without paperwork and things probably being signed. And now, now she- at the time, she didn't seem to have a problem with anything, yeah. which is interesting. And she I wanted, guess. she cursed him out this is for the guy all the years of abuse. Yeah. yeah. And so she was like, you know, she wanted to see if he was really anybody. dead or something like that. Yeah. And, was, and I think yeah. she wanted her last say and ha ha, you got what you deserved kind of thing. Yeah. So it wasn't anything we thought would ever come back around. And now it has. There's this lawsuit. And um, we'll kind of dive into that a little more here. And Well, let's dive in. So we come to find out later, it's Kroner has kind of amped her up. Oh, we're paying, you know, little Mitzi or whatever stupid name. Yeah comes in she's like we're being so generous and we're paying all the legal fees for her because oh that poor thing and it's like really 
Yeah. No, they gassed her up to Sue or something. And so um, they're worried about all this money because where are we going to get this money? And um, there isn't, you know, there's no more money to really tap into. And so Dave goes over to the lady's house. We'll just talk this storyline yeah. real quick. He, Dave goes over to the lady's house because I think he's just had enough. Like he kind of snaps and he goes over there and he's like, so, you know, my brother did something Dom and she's like, well, how is it any of my problem kind of thing? And he goes, he lashes out at her. And I wonder if he did it because he knows as an abused woman to be controlled, like you're going to regress and kind of you're going to back down. And she ends up, he's like, you know that what you did was wrong. What's happened is wrong. And you're now trying to take away a business from my whole family and blah, blah, blah. And so she ends up ripping up the papers and is like, fine, just go away. You know, like it goes away because he kind of goes at her. Yeah. Kind of judge him a little for doing it the way he did. And I yeah. wonder if it really was planned that he was doing it that way, knowing she was an abused woman, knowing that an intimidation would get her to back down probably because of what she had been through. Because I didn't even think of that when I was watching it. But now that I'm like talking it, I'm like, ooh. That was very manipulative of him if he did or if he was just losing his cool. And I think you're just mad because, you know, she I think to him, it was more like now she's being used by Kroner. Yeah. You know, she's being manipulated by them, which I think is true. I just think this whole idea of like mental anguish and all this stuff, you know, is is interesting to talk about because. I. I. I mean, everybody has different opinions on what our role is and all that. I don't believe it is our place to shield people from reality. Yeah. But I think if we're a smart business person, they need to sign waivers, clearly, which he didn't do, which he should have. But, you know, ultimately, if they sign a waiver and see something that upsets them... I don't know. I mean, you know, we're we're not it's not our place to tell people what's appropriate and inappropriate for them to see or or want to see or to deny them that, but we have to be very cognizant of the fact that people then, you know, will maybe come back and try to sue you for letting them do what they demanded right. to do. You well, know, we're damned if we do, we're damned if yeah. we don't. Because if we tell someone you may not see your loved one, we yeah. will not allow it, which they have the right. It's their loved one. They can transfer to a different funeral home. We'll yeah. allow that. We as a business can say, no, we are not yeah. going to allow it because of the condition of the person. So then the people then go on to tell everybody that we wouldn't let them see their loved one. They never get a chance to say goodbye. And it's all our fault. So then we're to blame or we let them see them and then we get sued later because, oh, no, the trauma so it's, sometimes it's we're damned if we do damned if we don't. And like you said, why do why are we the gatekeepers who have yeah. to decide what is good for someone else's mental state? That's not really our job is to tell people that we can explain the situation. They can make up their own minds. But why does that come back on on us per se? And it does. We are going to be the bad guys on either side. It just doesn't seem like a very fair position. Um, it doesn't at all. And you know, we do a lot of like case studies and stuff in the in the law class that I teach. And there's a lot of a lot of things about that where families will sue funeral homes for you know mental trauma, whatever, however they word it. You know, in a particular yeah. case, when it's like, but if I hadn't, you would have sued me for not letting you. And guess what? Seeing your loved one dead is mentally traumatizing. It's supposed to be. Right. You know, we can, we can do all the restorative art and all the stuff in the world and they're still dead and it's still sad. Yeah. Seeing you know that it's not I mean? going to bring this closure. I hate the word closure. I do too. And it doesn't not... close. Loss doesn't close. There's no closing out that emotional path. And so you're not going to see them and go, oh, I'm magically perfect again. Oh, I'm good. I'm fine now. Like, no. And so it's not our job to make 
I don't know. I, I'm trying to think how to word this. It isn't like offensive in any way, but it, it's it's our job to to do certain things, absolutely. But it is not our job to make death not hurt people or not sad or not. Yeah, you know what I mean? We don't control that part of it. No, we don't. And and if you are a person who wants to see your loved one's body in the state that they come in from the medical examiner's office and you sign a, a waiver, I feel you c- yeah. should be allowed to do that. And and that is your choice as an individual. And then you should not then come back on the business and say, well, they shouldn't have allowed it because if you don't allow it, then you'll be sued for right. not letting them. And, and uh-huh. now they're just, it's like, what do you do? But at the same time, like, I just think the general People are so happy and and most, again, most families are reasonable and are never going to do anything like this. And the ones that do are probably the ones that are, would do that anywhere right. in other places too. They're just those people. I'm looking you know? for that opening. And yeah, unfortunately, when you have a business that's run off of a lot of emotion yeah. and there's financials and there's this thing you want to blame for somebody. Yeah. But I mean... I it think- is not. It is not our job to make viewing your loved one not hurt or not no. sad. And so this idea, and and there's like this article. I'd have to find it, but but my, I make my students read it, and it's about it is about mental anguish and basically the fact that like it's not the funeral home's job to prevent you from being mentally anguished. That's part of the yeah. process for a lot of people. And, um, you know, this idea that we're supposed to protect your emotions is misplaced um, because it's it's really not that's that's not our role. No. And I think sometimes funeral directors go into protector mode yeah. and that's when it 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 can get you into trouble almost by going you go too far each way. Yeah. Too far. Like, go ahead and see everything. And you're going to have to just deal with it or, yeah. Hey, we are really not going to let you see this. Right. Person, even though we maybe should have in that situation, because it really wasn't as bad as it, you know? All. Yeah. And so I think you do get errors on both sides sure. of the extremes. And then it's easy for, you know, Oh, this is a situation. Well, two years later, I'm going to now go and say that because I'm still dealing with grief and maybe the the image did haunt me and maybe problems that I'm just going to sue somebody because I want to I'm not saying that all lawsuits are, um, Frivolous. happen, yeah. but I think there's just too much when you factor in the funeral home side that can be misconstrued as we've talked about with how media spins things and can, can go different ways. And there's too many factors that I had a lawyer reach out to me recently and they're like, Hey, we want to, you know, a professional, whatever for the case. And they explained some of the case. I was like, yep, I don't want to even be any part of that because I'm like, that has far too many factors Yep, that I can't, I don't know the answers and you don't know the answers to what might have gone into this. And so you can't say it was negligence. You can't say it was this with what you have just told me. And I'm like, I don't want to be part of it just to say that I got to do that yeah. and claim things because I, I don't know anybody that could stand there and tell you definitively one way or another. So no, of course not. I just Most am not going to be that person, but I think you can swing things different ways, unfortunately, when it comes. You absolutely to- can. And, you know, we are not, we're just human beings. And there's this idea, I think, I think a little bit pervasive within the industry itself that we know what's best for people. And we don't, yeah, we know, no, we don't. Not. Does viewing the body help some families? Yep. Does it harm some families? Yep. yep. And so all we can do is believe what our families are telling us at the time that they, what they need, not think we know what they need because we don't yep. and do the best that we can do. But, but I do, you know, this, this kind of irritated me a little bit, just this idea that like you would insist on seeing somebody and then be mad that they showed you that like I, at some point yeah. you, you have to, people have to have personal responsibility, even when they are in emotional states and you can't, you can't absolve yourself of any, of any responsibility for your own actions because you were in an emotional state. Right. You, like you still have to either say, I shouldn't have done that. That's on me. 
And it's like people are so unwilling to take responsibility for their own actions and reactions. And being in grief does not absolve you of being responsible for yourself. When I'm wondering, how did Kroner even know that she saw him? Like, that's part of the story we're never going to know because it was, they did it for a storyline. But yeah, I, I, no other funeral home is going to just know that, that she went and saw them. So anyway, so we've got um, Nate and Brenda go see the rabbi who is a little flirtatious with Nate and Brenda kind of picks up on it even during this counseling session that they're supposed to be having. And they try and come off as this pleasingly great couple and it's just not. And so they leave and they go back. Um, do they go back to the, are they standing in the funeral home? I think they are. They're standing in the funeral home chapel when he tells her about yes. Lisa and the baby. And she's like, Oh, I can't believe you would lie to me. And I, her reaction is so on point. Like she plays it so well. Like she's pretending to react big, but yet she's also, you can see that she's kind of happy that he has a dark secret too, because she has a dark secret. Yep. And now she can't be, you know, she's got something on him where even if you were to find out that she's been cheating on him, it's not as bad as getting someone else pregnant. You know what I mean? Uh, So it's almost like this gross, like she's, going to pretend like like she's almost reveling in a way of him being the one in the wrong because she was afraid it was going to have to be her you know what yeah. i mean even though i feel like hers is way worse than his oh it is i think so Me. but i mean neither is both bads or bads i mean they're not good so they've got uh-huh. the lady from the nursing home down in the prep room and the rabbi stops by first. Oh, yeah. yeah. First, Sorry. the rabbi stops by because she's in the neighborhood and wanted to pass on a pre need thing to him, which is just weird. That that whole like, hey, I just happened to be around the corner and wanted to give you this guy's number. I mean, this was before I guess texting and like that easily sharing the information and then they come in and they're sitting on a couch yeah but it's nighttime like call somebody the next day you know it's weird i i I think she knows what she's doing and she's like you know they they taught he says yeah i told brenda about you know everything and she's like wow that's a lot of information and stuff and then at one point i don't remember how they how she says it but she's like he goes i don't know how i can talk to you and she goes because i'm off limits she goes no matter what I, I can, you and I could never be. And so that makes it easier for you to communicate with me because you know that I'm, I'm not going to be one of those people yeah. for you because he's led a very promiscuous life. It, yes. it kind of comes out. And so it's a very interesting kind of inner exchange. Like, I feel like if Josh and I had gone to a therapist or not a therapist, like a counselor pre-wedding and it had been some, you know, gorgeous check. And then she ca- happens to stop by his house to and comes in to have a drink and stuff like lines and crossing. Yes. And I, I just uh, weird, 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 weird. So I, I think they push limits a lot with, you know, where they're at with people and what they're doing. And I just things I would never do, I guess. But yeah, no, no I agree. And then, yes, the. um the deceased Edith arrives and is at the funeral home and how she's wrapped up. Like, did you take note of that? Like plastic and rope, like just where did she come from? Uh, The nursing home. Oh, please. So they wrapped her in white plastic and then rope, like three rope. Like they're going to go dispose of her body in a lake. Like that's like. Nursing homes don't do that. And funeral homes don't do that. So I don't, I don't know who they like. We're trying to give the impression did that because the nursing home isn't going to do anything at all. And the funeral home is not going to do that. So she would have still been in her clothes in a sheet you know, all that I'll have stuff. nursing homes will take and they will take the sheet off and they will tie it. Sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. So the body is bound up. But yeah. I mean, I mean, not like no. nylon rope, but more like, like a, uh, <laughs> a cord. I don't even know how to explain, but 
The image of it, it is I, like, I, like I know what you're talking about. Killer why is she you know, that's why I said, where did she come from? Because it looks like, I don't know, but why no. Not? And so Rico, she doesn't have any clothes on. And Rico's like looking at her and um, I don't remember what, but it's like something's not right here. And he like takes her dentures out and finds that like she's got like a whole hot dog in her throat and he just went like this like how big of a hot dog do you eat <laughs> i don't know <laughs> how big was it i mean it was a, how big is a hot dog normal <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but yeah the whole thing is intact and he pulls it out of her throat oh uh, so then it's you know did she just choke on it i don't think so or did like the roommate put it i don't know so they uh, call the coroner as they should but it's just funny to me, like, I guess, I guess that could happen. You know, you wouldn't, if you, if you were a lady in a nursing home and maybe, you know, you were old and you died what you, they thought was in your sleep and they, they probably something. would not, huh? They just miss something maybe sometimes, yeah. you know, but a whole sure. And I think he saw it because they come in and they're like, so why did you look for this? Yeah. And said, well, there's contusions all around the neck. Yeah. But they wouldn't be there from CPR. And yeah. so he said it, it looked like, you know, something yeah. was going. And so I opened and pulled out this whole hot dog and they're like, kind of looking through and they're like, well, who did the CPR and stuff? And they look and it's Vanessa, you know? Yeah. And so he's like, that is my wife. And they look at him like, oh, and so he kind of has opened this can that he took the ethical higher road and reported it and did something about it where he knew that it could come back on them bad. And so Vanessa does end up losing her job and they find out that the roommate did do it. And all I can picture is these two bitty old ladies. One is like, how are you going to get other I know. and her stuff in a hot dog? Down. Like, come on. First of all, I just don't oh, see yeah. a whole hot dog going down a throat like that without no. some more battle or something. But <laughs> I just think it's crazy. I mean, yeah. So I don't know. It, it's just. I, I don't know. I mean, that's what happens. And so it is it is interesting. But I mean, it there's there's something realistic in there, too. Like I've had several times that we've had called a coroner on a body that we got in because something looked funny and yeah. they didn't investigate. So that's I think that happens. Um, never a hot dog down a throat. No. And sometimes, you know, coroners are, are interesting. The things that they will investigate and the things that they won't. Yeah. You know, like this man, he was like a hundred years. I'm not even kidding. I think he was a hundred years old and he choked on asparagus in the dining hall of the nursing home. Everybody saw it. Everybody saw it. And they did a full autopsy and all this stuff. And I just thought, my God, like literally 60 people saw this man choke to death and the paramedics come in and he died there in the nurse. They didn't even take him off site. And they're going to do an autopsy on this 100-year-old man. Like, he choked on a spare. Just please let him be, you know? Oh. And then other times, it's like stuff you're like, what in the world? And they don't even no. take it as that a case. Is it interesting. is interesting. And some of it, I hate to say, is on budget, too. Like, sure. we only have so much budget for the month for post-mortem exams. So we have to be strict on which you if know, you're going to kill somebody do it at no. the end of the month exactly right <laughs> no well, i mean not pointers for anybody come on well again you know part of part of autopsies that, that the general public doesn't understand is when they're done by a coroner it's a medical legal thing so maybe because it was a nursing home they thought there could be some kind of legal right. ramifications State. so they did it you know that there's a lot that goes into those decisions yeah. but that one i'll never forget i'm like yeah like Everybody saw this. This poor man did not need a full autopsy over a witness choking. Asparagus death. Like, God bless. Asparagus, though. Yeah. Poor guy. But, you know. Oh. So, so we've go got, let's talk about the Keith storyline. So, yeah. Keith's parents are coming to town and it kind of plays out. And then he goes to visit his sister and they tell yeah. him that, you know, the parents want to take Taylor back with them. Um, you know, live with Dave and Keith is no place for her to be and that they need to go back. But then we kind of find out as Keith is talking to his sister in jail, 
that the dad is abusive yeah. and it kind of had beat on them and had been very not great when they were growing yeah. up. They don't want, she's like, please don't let Taylor go there to have to go through that too. We barely made it out. We're not going to do this to them. And um, so it kind of plays out that way. And then Keith stands up to his dad, but then uh, Keith has an incident at work and sends Taylor away without even letting Dave know. So Keith is on a path right now with a lot going on. So he got clear to the shooting. Yeah. He goes and he beats this guy up while yep. he's on duty. And so he's under review again. Yep. So is he like his dad? Does he have an anger issue? Kind of Yeah, I think he does. Like his dad. And that's sure. what kind of is giving you a glimpse in his past to maybe why he is why how he is. He is. is. Um, which is so, oh, it's so sad. You know, nature versus nurture and all this stuff with, you know, personalities and characteristics. And so Dave gets really upset because Taylor's just gone now. And he, yeah. he and it's just a bit weird situation um, with it's all no of good. it. It's no good. Yeah, it's no. just bad stuff all around. Um, so this pre-need that Nate is supposed to do, he goes to this, I guess it's a hospice to meet this. I couldn't family. tell what it was. That looked like a it nursing was, home, but it is. Maybe. I mean, the guy's too young for it to be probably a nursing home. So yeah, maybe a hospice kind of home would be like an inpatient thing. Hospice. I don't know. Yeah. And so he goes there to meet with this young man who has pancreatic cancer, um, which is interesting because the guy was like, I don't care what happens to me. Well, then why are you doing it? Then why do you want to do a prenatal if you don't care? Yeah. It was just weird, you yeah. know, like he was like, oh, I have this guy that wants to write his, but he didn't really want to because he kept saying he doesn't care and it doesn't matter. So why would he even want, why would he even want to do that? Um, it didn't, none of it made sense. And then like, as he's planning it, there's no religious context to it, but so yeah, why would the rabbi, no rabbi so that I found was weird too, because it never comes back to the synagogue or the rabbi being part of it, or there any connection like later when he does die. Sorry, we're supposed to forget about it. But. Um, it's just weird. It's weird how it all kind of plays out, but it is weird. He does. I think Nate finds a little bit of a kindred spirit in this guy in some ways, and um, kind of connects to him and says, "I'm going to just come visit you every day. Like I'm coming." Yeah. And the guy's like, "You don't have to do that. I don't need anybody here." And Nate's like, "Yeah, I am. I'm yeah." Here. And so I think because Nate is also scared of impending death possibly and being alone and what may happen. And so he doesn't want to see somebody else experience that. Yeah. Any loneliness or or fear in the end. Sure. Um and Parker and Claire get some shrooms from her aunt. Let me tell you something about shrooms. If you listen, <laughs> you don't have to confirm or deny if you've ever tried mushrooms. I have not. And I will neither all right that all right I have. Let me tell you what, I don't understand this at all. All it did was make me poop and puke. It was terrible. I've tried like five times because I thought I was the problem. Like maybe I didn't eat, maybe I ate too much. Maybe I didn't eat. Maybe I should have done this every single time. The worst thing ever. And so to see these two just like, I don't know. They didn't say they felt like they were going to puke. Yeah. They, but I'm they just like, how, if you, how are all these people having these mushroom experiences? And literally every time, I mean, even just like the tiniest bit you could even take, it was like immediate bathroom situation for me. And I'm a little bit irritated about it, to be honest, because they're supposedly this like great thing and everybody's doing all this psychedelic stuff for all this, you know, reasons. And I'm just like, no, I can't, I can't, I can't enjoy anything. I can't even do that. When they say like mushroom or micro dosing with, you know, specific strains of shrooms are supposed to be one of the best things for different like anxieties or um, gastrointestinal or all these things. I don't Not know. Me. Not me. I don't know. But they had a lovely trip. They were having the best time. She made her mom these pants and jingle bells on them and was telling her mom how much she loved her. And, you know, of course, Ruth is loving it because she has no idea why, where this she has is no idea. From and stuff. But it was just kind of a funny comical interchange, all of it. And then, you know, the next day, Claire's like, oh, my God, I want to die. Don't ever wear those pants. 
this oh is terrible. Gosh. Like, make it all stop. They have a lot of drug experiences on this show that I have not experienced myself because apparently my body is just not going to metabolize those things properly. I don't get it. But I was like, what the hell? Like, they just eat one little mushroom and then they're on this trip for like 12 hours and nobody's sick. And that's that is not realistic. Well, Brenda, um, Brenda gets high and she has all these flashbacks of orgy parties her parents used to have. So we are get you know, as, yeah. as messed up as her childhood was, we're getting even more glimpses into why some of maybe where she's at now mm-hmm. is coming from. And then she's getting high on her porch and these two teenage boys come by and she ends up bringing them both inside and having sex with them both and getting high with them and it's this like, just goes to show like maybe i'm messed up but i'm i'm thinking those i would not be first of all i would never bring two young men into my house because i would think they were gonna rob me not that i would that's where my brain goes i'm like oh these teenagers are gonna take that they're gonna have sex with me but again for whatever reason brenda every person with a penis she looks at wants to have sex with her i do not understand this in this show no. this to me is one of the most unrealistic parts of this show is that brenda is just a can sex have goddess sex, so, yeah, yeah with anybody that looks at her and and let alone like why these two idiots on bikes like what are you getting out of that no i i I I feel like maybe this is now our low. Maybe mm, now yeah. we hit oh, rock bottom. Maybe. So she, I mean, she has hit quite rock bottom by doing this. And so, yeah. um, you know, you have this whole, this whole thing and then kind of goes away. What else happened during this? Um, uh, oh, uh, Ruth, um, Nick like gets visited by the Russian mobster dude and is like, uh, you still owe me money. And then the guy yeah. later when Nikolai's not there and Ruth's like, well, how much does he owe you? I will pay it. And he's like, yeah, 82,000 or whatever it is. And yeah. so she whips out a freaking gym bag filled with cash, sticks it in a paper bag and sends him on his way. And I'm like, huh? Do you just walk around with that, Ruth? Like, where are you keeping that? And why do you have all that money? And like, you are missing out on interest. And all, I what mean, what level were you participating? Were you planning or gonna go to? Like, what amount of money was going to be acceptable to you to give? Like, it just right. I, it's bananas. Ruth, Ruth is just off crazy train. Um, and then we've got uh, the creepy counselor guy. And he ends up getting fired or let go from. The, oh, no, that's in the next episode. Never mind. We still go back and talk to him. Every time they show him, I just think he's creepy. There's something creepy about There's him. something not OK. Yeah. I think was that the episode? No, that is the episode where she's like, hey, I don't see a picture of you. And well, his name friend is. they broke up or whatever. They broke up. And so I'm like, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Nothing happens. But I just keep waiting for like inappropriateness or something. Uh, it's not quite hasn't happened yet, but we're building. We're building towards all of it, I feel like. So, yeah. I, you know, again, watching this show back 20 plus years later from the first time I watched it and being the same age as Claire is supposed to be. I remember thinking like, it's just funny how, as you get older, like people, I I was looking at that like that high school people are children. Now, when we were in high school, we were grown, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean though? Like the you first feel time around. So adult when you're in the moment. Uh, the first time around, I was like, well, girl, she's 18. She's dead. And now I'm like, that is a child. Like that, that is, is a baby. That oh is a baby. God. Yeah. Like I would just I, like high schoolers to me are barely sentient beings now. But when we were in high school, we were completely grown. So it's just so, funny again. Cause yeah. he's not that I mean, for a high school counselor, what he's probably, I don't know, mid 30s. Not even. I mean, he could be what, 25? He could be. So he's young. Right. So if she's 18 and he's 25, I mean, that's illegal. Well, it's not even it's weird at that age. At this age, it's nothing. But it's still like that idea when you are that young that you're grown up. And then 20 years later, you're like 
those are not even humans yet. Oh my gosh. Isn't that funny? It's just funny. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy to look at. And you can't convince a person who is 18 that they barely know much about the world yet. No. But yet, once you get later, you look back and go, oh my gosh, I didn't know anything. Oh no. So it's, yeah. It's, you got to learn it on your own that you have a lot to learn when for it comes sure. to everything. So for sure. That's about oh. it for this episode, I think, isn't it? It is. Yeah. So next week will be episode 12 called I'll Take You. And we're we're peeking to the end of the season here. Two more episodes for the end of the season. And then we get this kind of cliffhanger we get left on to go into season or season three. So really excited with this to see kind of where we end off at the end of this whole season. But yep. Check us out next week, guys. Leave your comments below what you think about this episode. The hot dog episode is what I'm going to refer to. It. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, and next week, we'll check out episode 12. Bye. Bye. Bye.